All right, so welcome back. Uh, we're going to delve into a little poetry now. We're going to study and look at the life of uh, Emily Dickinson before delving into her poetry. Now, it, the question posed on this, uh, this initial slide here, why learn about a poet's life before exploring her poetry? Well, a, po a poet is an author, undoubtedly, learning about how uh, that person lived, the times in which she, in this case, grew up. Uh, familial influences certainly uh, would tell you a, a lot, a lot, a lot about why she wrote the way she wrote. And I know we haven't touched on an Emily Dickinson poem yet, but I think this is a, a good way to, to start. Absolutely. Yeah. So Emily uh, Dickinson, like all great artists, uh, was mostly an unknown during her life and is now one of the greatest American poets, certainly in the top ten, Right, expert? Um, I would think so. <laughs> yeah. Of classic all-time poets, yeah. Yeah, yeah. During yeah. her lifetime, she only had seven poems uh, published in her lifetime. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because they wanted to change them. Her poetry was unconventional for the time. Very unconventional. And yeah, well, so they wanted to con constantly change it and make it look like one of their poems, and she wouldn't accept didn't that. Want that. Yeah, yeah. Very headstrong. Yeah, she wrote during this romantic period. She's associated with the Gothic writers. If when you think of Gothic writers, you think of Edgar Allan Poe. Uh, what's another one? Um, that's the one that immediately springs to mind. Yeah, well, it's just a, a group of writers that wrote a lot about death, and Emily Dickinson wrote a lot about death. She certainly did, and uh, and again, she's associated with us the idea of transcendentalism. Yeah. Um, you know, uh, and I'll, I'll leave that to, uh, my father, if he, if he wants to, to talk us through that. Cause I'm, I, I could use some, some, uh, assistance with that concept as well. So I, this is why you bring in the expert. Oh, woo. Um, well, it's the idea that, um, there is something out there, but the only way that you can touch that thing that is out there or come in contact with that thing that is out there is through your through your intuition. So it's um, your intuition will tell you those things that are right. So when when you feel close to to say God or transcendentalists focused a lot on nature and they thought that God was in nature, <coughs> um, they would go out in the nature and then um, they they would try to, you know. Like Hemingway. reach out, yeah, yeah. Well, not well. Hemingway liked to go out and kill things. These guys, <laughs> these guys just wanted to commune with nature. You know, so a little bit of a difference. That's that's right. Who? What was I? No, I was thinking of Walt Whitman. Oh yeah, yeah. She's Walton Pond. Walton yeah. Pond. Walt Whitman. Yeah. I, I don't know what Hemingway. Well, Walden Why? Pond was not Walt Whitman. W Walden Pond was um, David Thoreau. Yeah. But he was real good friends with uh, Walt Whitman. In a or Ralph Waldo Emerson. Ralph Waldo Emerson. And um, that's a whole different story. But that, that one's funny because he went and spent that year supposedly living in a little cabin off isolated in the woods off right. of Walden pond. Uh, but he, that's not exactly true in that he would oftentimes go over at night to have dinner at Emerson's house. Right. Right. <laughs> so her critic were the guys who were big into transcendentalism. Yeah. Yeah. And contemporaries of, of our, our study here, Miss Dickinson. Yeah. Uh, Dickinson was an eccentric. Uh, she was, uh -huh. a, you agree with that one? Oh yeah. <laughs> she was a helpless agoraphobic. She was a homebody. Uh, I don't know if she was agoraphobic. Well, full, full disclosure here. I, I, 
I bought this yeah. off of Teachers Pay Teachers. So uh, you could. Well, this is certainly a, open to refutation. So why wasn't she a homebody? Why wasn't she agoraphobic? Well, for for a long time, that was what was thought. Mm -hmm. um, but as they've discovered more things about her and um, and more of her life has kind of opened up, opened up a bit. It, it's it seems like she made a conscious decision to withdraw from the public. It wasn't because she was afraid of it uh, or anything. She just made a conscious decision that she was going to um, withdraw and kind of live within her own mind. Mm -hmm. Now the sexual orient, go ahead. No, go ahead. Go ahead. I'm done. The, the, now, while her sexual orientation didn't matter one jot uh, in the, the eight, you know, today wouldn't matter at all and doesn't matter. Uh, the fact that uh, it was she she thought was thought to have had a, an inappropriate relationship with her sister in law, Sue Gilbert Dickinson, her brother, Austin's wife. Um, go ahead. No, this is well, what I have you on here for. To, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, in my research on her, I, I've never ran across that. Um, I, I've never ran, ran across anybody saying that she was a lesbian. Um, and so this must be something new that's come up. Um, because, like I said, in, in my research on her, wasn't even suggested. And I, I went through seven or eight different sources that it wasn't suggested. So, um, I don't know. I mean, whether she is or she isn't, it, like you said, it doesn't matter. No. But I, I think, I don't know, I, I think. But then let me ask you. Uh, sure. She she dedicated a bunch of poems to Sue. Mm -hmm. She was unnaturally close with her sister-in-law. So why was it considered unnaturally close? Well, would you dedicate poem after poem after poem to your sister-in-law? Isn't that a little odd? Um, I don't know. Shakespeare uh, dedicated, I don't know, seventy-five of his sonnets to a uh, a young a young man. Doesn't mean he's gay, you know. So I, I maybe mean, just how eccentric she was. Maybe that was just something. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, it doesn't I, matter I mean, one it, one lick. It 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 doesn't. I mean, it, but I mean, if you're looking at close relationships, I mean that that was a she did have a close relationship with her, but she was also very close to her her sister who lived with her, and um right. and her brother who who lived in the house next to her, mm -hmm. uh, with Sue. So. It was just for her. It was just the four of them. She, we, when she withdrew, those four became her world. Right. You know. So, go ahead. Right. So, Mr. Dickinson was a father. Uh, was <laughs> Mr. <laughs> Mr. Dickinson was indeed a father, as evidenced yes, by the portrait was. of his three children there. <laughs> so, uh, Mr. Dickinson was a lawyer politician he served one term i believe in the u.s house of representatives yes and uh just a community leader in amherst massachusetts uh, emily came into the world around 18 not around she came into the world in 1830 and was the middle child she came right in between austin and lavinia uh, had a very distant relationship with her parents i get the sense that her parents didn't really understand her all that well no, I don't think they did. Yeah. But she had a very, um, she had, she had a, a, a big desire to be close to her father. Right. You know, she very much wanted his approval and very much um, loved him. Um, but it was just, they just came from two completely different worlds in, in their heads. You know, he was a politician, a banker. Um, a, you know, that's where his mind was. And he was very much women should behave a certain way. And, and Emily didn't fit that mold at all. No, definitely not. Definitely not. 
So she was educated, which was still, you know, unusual for women at that time. Um, and attended the Amherst Academy from ages 10 to 17, which her father founded. Yeah. Which might explain why she got a spot. Could very well be. <laughs> Independent, introspective uh, gal. Can you comment any on her childhood? Do you have anything to add? Um, well, her childhood, she was evidently very much of a socialite. You know, or the... A lot of people thought she was withdrawn her whole life, but I guess um, new stuff coming to light paints her more as just kind of more of a, a normal, social, outgoing young girl. You know, she had friends. She liked to go and do things. Um, I know she had a friend uh, who died that she was, that was very close to, uh, and she sat at her bedside. I think it was when she was 16. Mm -hmm. sat at her bedside was allowed to for three days and, and watched her friend die. You know, she wanted to be there to comfort her. Wow. You know, so. So she dropped out of the Mount Holyoke seminary, uh, seven months. She was there. She had this kind of religious, uh, crisis, was a real rebel uh, against the religious fervor of her day. I mean, the, the, we're not talking about the Puritans, but I, I would classify society in in the uh, East, the Northeast back then as as, as kind of puritanical. Oh yeah, I guess compared uh, to today's standards. <laughs> anyway, yeah. Amherst at that time I think was very Calvinistic. Yeah, and. Um, she was very scientific. She read a lot of science books and was very involved in if it, if it can't be proved by science, then it, it doesn't exist or whatever, you know? So, um, so yeah, she had a, they were really pushing the religion at Holyoke and she wanted to do some science and that wasn't going to happen. <laughs> so yeah, she dropped out. Yeah. Did she believe in, in God or was that? I, I think she did, um, but it it wasn't something she practiced much in her life. I see. 